Steve Craig, Las Vegas Wire. Um, when starting work on uh, the prequels, I know that there were certain sounds that were taken from the original trilogy, but my question is, were they tweaked at all, or when they were transferred to digital, did you do, did you do a little tweak into them? Did you change them, or were some of them the exact same sounds? Well, as we started on the prequels, we wanted to update and bring to up onto the digital form of the entire library, which at that point had been analog and quarter inch tape. And uh, actually what we did was we, we copied everything over that had been uh, an effect that had been logged in the, in the first you know, three films plus any other things we made for specials or uh, the animated series that had gone on in the 80s. We kept collecting it all together. One thing we did do was go back to a set of tapes even earlier. The, the way I worked originally is I had the original tapes that I recorded things on. And those were edited and copies made and then back was further process. We went back to the original tapes and brought in a lot of material, first generation, and uh, now you know, the lightsabers and some of the stuff I know we'd be using again and again or building on it. We got went back to the earliest source possible. So and we kind of remixed them? There was some of it was a little remixed, yeah. I mean, most, most of it were just individual elements, uh, you know, that, that made things up, like the, the blasters, when they went in. A lot of that was done on two-track tapes, so those were two sounds on two tracks, and I mixed them together. We brought those both in digitally, and then we mixed it, or, or transferred it the way it was. Um, we tried to, obviously, we were aware that I mean, these were signature sounds that people expected to hear, and of course, they, they would already had built up a legacy with them, so we wanted to build upon that, and that's what we've done since that time, as, as everything's been added to the library, including Clone Wars, which I don't work on, but uh, you know, Matthew Wood, continue to build up the library. There's probably 12 to 15,000 sounds now in that whole collection. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Next. Okay, that's it. Let's go. Dave's more serious XO Sound Live Radio. Um, just really curious, since the 70s, you know, when you did the original sounds for Star Wars up to now, what were some of the best technological advances that helped the medium? And do you think also that the being able to have all these advancements is so much of a detriment in a way where you know you don't necessarily are encouraged to think outside the box like you did with the original sounds. Well, you're tr it's true. Uh, the uh, the biggest innovation, of course, is you know everybody knows that we've gone digital, which means that, that all the material is now uh, files in the computer stored in that form. And the huge advantage of that has been the lack of generation logs. That is, we, in, the, in the original films, a tremendous amount of effort had to be made to protect the quality of each sound, be it music, or other effects, because it, it went actually about 10 generations from the time you recorded something until it reached the theater. You know, you can see you did so many steps, stages in the process. And each time, there was always the potential for some degradation of the sound. Okay. The more distorted, it builds up noise and so on. That doesn't, it's not a problem we face anymore, so it makes it, you know, much, you just don't have the labor to watch over copies, and that's just how we know things will be duplicates. That's great. Um, and also, being digital, we can have things in a database that you can find things very quickly. Mm -hmm. The sounds used to be stored in little rolls of film, in boxes, in an entire wall. And if you wanted something, you had to climb up, find it, open a box, bring it down, open it up, wind it onto a reel, play it on a machine, and oh, that's not what I want, or you know, to take it and put it away. So the labor of finding something, it might be minutes, if not half a day to find something. Uh, whereas now, it's, you can browse the library and click and audition things instantly. Um, you point out a fact that once it is digital, with all the wonderful software we have nowadays, uh, you can do things very fast, and there is somewhat of a tendency to just uh, use onboard programs. And you know, since I can do a lot of sound design on my laptop, I can sit there at like couch at home and work on something. Maybe it is limiting sometimes because in the earlier generation of Star Wars films, it was all mechanical. You know, you still go out and record lots of things, but if you wanted to process it to change its speed or to make it phase, you had to come up with a mechanical way of doing it, running a loop between two machines and 
put your thumb on a, on, a, on a reel to slow something down. And there were lots of tricks that involved a little bit of a performance. And, and, and like any time you perform something, you get unique results that you sometimes can't ever reproduce again. Uh, and so uh, creatively, I still love the old methods. And I still use some of them when I can. I still, on a rare occasion, record something on tape. And sometimes I'll put it on tape to, to speed it up or slow it down or something of that sort. Or we'll use an old analog reverb device or something of that sort. You know, we run into a guitar amplifier and kick it so the spring reverb shimmers or something. So I've, I've tried not to lose touch with that sort of thing. Yes. Experiment with things. How long does that process typically take? Is there a typical time frame? You mean on a given feature film? Yeah, that, that you spend. You take what you can get. <laughs> Different. Some some filmmakers plan ahead and give you development time. Uh, George always had the vision of putting on a sound designer long before the picture started shooting. So it sounds once you had a script or you had artwork that could be inspiring. Uh, one person myself could begin thinking and collecting and building sounds up so and then as the film's being edited uh, we would put sounds in and as an experiment to see what we liked and didn't like so there was an ongoing process so usually i had uh, you know a year let's say of development of something before the rest of the crew came on and it was sort of a rush to announce you know complete the editing sound editing in a normal way. So I, I was given generous amounts of time. Um, other films, you, sometimes you work for somebody and you just have a few days or a few weeks to do that process. It's not typical for uh, Hollywood producers to hire someone long term now uh, before they want to, before they have to, because it's expensive. And it's not, it's, just, it's not really a habit for most of them. So it varies, but sometimes very quick things are done. The longest time I actually ever had was on Wally, and I worked for I three years of work in the work on that. It was, it was animation, and they were very meticulous, and it goes slowly, you know, from pixel by pixel to work your way through the world. But it's a good process. Yes? Okay. Uh, I was really just also curious what is it like for you when it comes to the final mix when you're battling? Say the composer who wants to get his music up, especially when it comes to Star Wars, John Williams' scores are yeah. so iconic. But yet, the sounds you created are also so iconic. I'm sure. What's the battle like when it comes to actually battle the icons? Yeah. Well, you say battle. I guess it is in some way. It's not the it's not the battle personally. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. As as always, even going back to the first Star Wars film, you know, the the, uh, the relationship of music and, and sound effects is has always been tremendous amount of work to uh, work that out, you know, because they both share the same soundtrack in the end, and they both are, have a significant effect on what you feel about the movie. And I love movie music. Um, there, There is give and take. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of music in the films that is really going on. There was more music, or, you know, proportionately in the films, more continuous music. And it made the mixing more of a challenge because uh, also editorially, just as films generally have, the, the cutting pace speeds up, shots are shorter, and more happens within each shot because there's more control over all the animation. So everything is packed in, and there's more notes, and there's more sound, so it gets more difficult. Um, the mix becomes a subtractive process where you put everything up, all the music, all the sounds, all the dialogue, and you listen and say, oh my goodness, it doesn't make any sense, it's too much happening, so you just start pulling things out and it forces you to decide what is the most important thing. The, the best relation, and the best situation with music and effects is if uh, the music gets delivered uh, before we have to pre-mix the film, and sometimes this happens. That way, we can listen to the music in the monitors as we add the sounds in. So that's a, the best situation when, when I think something in the music is very deep, and I can try to put something in that's higher, in a higher register. Or if it's something continuous, then that sounds could be the rhythm, and, and, that, and then you then you're you're making the whole thing function like music. And sometimes that happens. They don't. The music is sacred to some degree. They 
they don't often drop a, a music cue for the sake of sound effects. Um, it's usually the other way around. Get used to that. It's, uh, you know, it's a, both things are important, and you can't have it all. They wrestle with it. That's what it is. <laughs> yes? Uh, Adam Goins with a Crazy Train Radio. Uh, like when that. you were hired to work on all the Star Wars projects, uh, were you given a lot of notes by George Lucas and everybody else involved? On the first film, you mean? Yeah. On, I, on the very first movie, I was I was brought in, and at that time we were working in, in San Anselmo um, in a residence. It's a very small number of people around, and I just sort of answered to George one. I was down in the basement in what later became his house, and, and he would wander down, and I would play things for him, and we'd discuss it. He might pick something if I had three or four choices, and, and he would give me direction that way. But there wasn't any other people giving me notes. Uh, it was sort of it was a one-on-one -on -one process for a number of months as I labored to create, you know, R two and lightsabers and so on. And I would I would cut the sounds and put them in and we'd do a temporary mix of a scene as the editors finished with the first version of the scene, the jaw was or, or something of that sort. And then we play in the theater with temporary with sound that I put in, sketchy sound. It's kind of an audition. And, and then you get some feedback from the editors and the crew. But it was mostly George who would come down and uh, you know I would often uh, I would line something up and say, today we're going to listen to laser guns. Uh, here's some choices. I'd always put my favorite number three because he would stop on number three. So if they were to salt the, the traces and so on. Um, but it was really just one on one for that initial build up of the law of the library. Yes? Well, as a follow up to that, is there a memory that you have? And Scott from New Bob, you do memories, so we're, I'm curious about like, your memory of when, in that process, you're like, well, this is going to be, I mean, you had a lot of freedom to work with him, but is there a point where you have a memory that this is going to be something special? Well, it was something special to me, because it's more or less my first job on a big feature film, and I, I thought, gee, this is great, I actually have a job, and I love adventure movies and science fiction, and here I was on something that was right up my alley. I felt like I had been uh, trained to do this, this movie, and you know, here I was. So I, I wasn't looking further than the release of the movie. It, I, no one at that time expected it to have that impact. You know, uh, the, we thought maybe we would please the science fiction uh, crowd that goes to movies, the people that went to see, you know, Logan's Run or Planet of the Apes or this sort of thing. Um, it wasn't looked upon as a, I didn't see it as a global phenomenon in any way. I was just happy to have work and it was, um, it was a stimulating, fun movie because it was, it just was uh, enjoyable to, to watch it every day and see it develop. And as sounds got put in and we would screen first a few scenes and then we'd attach more scenes together and begin to see the story. I remember we, the first time that we ran almost the whole picture at one time for ourselves. When it got to the point where uh, they're rescuing the princess from the, the detention cell, it got so exciting I could just feel goosebumps, you know, like this is really a great movie, this is fun. And then, but I, I was thinking just more or less the, the impact on myself, and I could tell the crew was excited, you know, like five or six people in the room. So, so it, it, it began, to, there were clues that this was going to be entertaining in a big way, and it got more exciting. That kind of a follow up to that original question about the original tapes. Did any of them start to deteriorate? And do you do a process of, I know some people will film, I guess, you know, bake it. Yeah, right. Did you have to do that or did you lose anything in the process uh, over the years? Yes, a lot of the quarter inch uh, magnetic tapes that uh, they changed the chemistry of the base of those tapes from 1981, 1982. So there's a, um, the tapes prior to that, from the first from the film and Empire are in perfectly good shape. They were a different chemistry. 3M didn't change the formula, and they they still played well. The tapes are, uh, for, for Return of the Jedi were in bad shape, and they were shedding. Um, um, as he mentioned, you can you can take those rolls of tape and carefully put them in a in a warm. I actually put them in an, I put them in an oven. But you learn not to put them in the oven and turn the heat on because it melts the plastic reels. 
But what you do is I put it in an oven with just a light bulb on them and an extension cord and leave it overnight and it, and it warms up the oven and it doesn't get any hotter than like 18 degrees or something. And that's enough to restabilize the material. You can take those tapes and for about a month or so you can play them and they're fine. And you can still save all the tapes. Um, so there's archives? Yeah, they're, they're still moving to the archive after we've copied them. I don't want to throw anything away. Right. I've tried not to lose anything. Uh, and because they can still be retrieved again. They haven't been, they're not unplayable. They just are sticky and they, they get gummed up in the machines and you have to clean them. And that's, that, that problem is faced. Any, any uh, sound people, those any tapes in that era, the 80s were really bad. I have tapes that go back to the 1950s when I was a kid and they still play fine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Jesse Arnsworth, Sci-Fi from uh, Would you say it's more difficult to create the organic sounds, like for the creatures and stuff, than it is to create like mechanical noises? Yes. The, it's the, the hardest thing for me is always to create creature voices because um, you're 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 asking, you're trying to really create an illusion for the audience. You know, everybody. We're all experts at interpreting dialogue or interpreting you know, how it sounds, you know, vocal expressions and what they mean. And so everybody's very sensitive and critical to that. So when you're trying to create a robot voice or some other alien character, an Ewok, a Jaw, or whatever, um, a Genos, um, you know that there'll be a critical ear put to it by the audience. And so it is hard. They always take more time. You know, I, in, in personal voice, trying to come up with a new kind of alien voice, and they're hard to come by. You know, it, I, I find it. You know, it, it's, um, you just can't invent five new ones. You know, every week because it's it's a it's a tough proposition. Uh, because what you're always trying to do is mask uh, maybe the human voice in some way, where you still get the emotions and the expression of it, but it seems to be coming from a completely alien thing or a robot. And of course, I try to make up new things, and, and it's, it is um, it becomes more challenging to find a new way of doing it each time. So those are those are hard to do. You know, say just you know, more explosions, which is fun. It's <laughs> costly, we're sure. What's that? Costly, we're sure too. Yeah, yeah. Sure. There you go again. Yeah. I'm sorry, pardon. Um, I know you're really modest, but it's, I was wondering if you kind of, well, I guess more of a two-part question, your influence upon the, the medium, because I, I talked to like a composer, Nathan Johnson, who, who's the music for a film that's coming out, he says you, you influenced him when he's going through the soundtrack, is finding, creating, going out and getting found sound and putting it into the soundtrack, which was heavily influenced by you. So one, do you understand your place in the history of sound when it comes to film, and two, for people who want to get into the industry, what would you recommend they do? Uh, well, I guess the first question, sure. I mean, I haven't had a lot of, um, you know, positive feedback. Or, you know, it's there's good and bad things about that too. You know, you you know, I think on the first film, Time Magazine, something referred to me as a genius or a wizard or something of that sort, and that kind of went to my head. And it's you know, you have to also get a balance with what's you know, you really can't accomplish and how important you are. I know that the work on Star Wars was a tremendous opportunity, uh, looking back on it. Um, I was there at the right time. It was a kind of a blessing. I know that I had done so many things in my childhood and teenage years uh, with sound and with being a little filmmaker that all came to fruition with a connection with the Star Wars you know, uh, franchise, which I'm thankful for because it was the basis for my career. And then, I, and then Star Wars did have a big impact, you know, it was Dolby and Mysterio, it was, uh, it was a, a new way of looking at science fiction movies, uh, you know, the sound and, and that legacy. It, it spawned, of course, a, of a whole, steered the course of Hollywood in a, in, a, in a different direction, including people's attitude about sound and so on. So I, I, I do feel thankful for being part of that. The second question is, what's my advice for people to get into this, that part of the business? Yes. Well, 
I, uh, my advice is kind of twofold. If you're interested in sound, uh, I've always found that the best um, ideas and material that I've uh, you know, come up with has been generally found sound. Uh, that sometimes it just comes by accident. I'm walking, I'm shopping, I hear something, and it gets my attention. I've learned that if some sound gets my attention, then it's worth recording and capturing it, even if I don't know what I'm going to do with it at that moment. But because it somehow rose out of the background and got my attention, um, it's worth getting. So I, I generally always have a recorder with me to get something in a convenience store if that's a funny hum in a refrigerator, which I've been recorded, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I recommend that, that you people collect sound, that, that they develop an awareness uh, and, and also an association, an awareness of the association sound has with our feelings and environments that we're in. That kind of experience comes in useful as a sound designer. Secondly, I think um, it's kind of my recommendation for uh, your education is important. Being part of the movie making process brings in almost every discipline. Uh, I've used some of every subject I ever took in school. You know, it might be in history or science or biology to. Uh, reason out what sounds might be like or uh, to uh, understand, you know, because we're always creating illusions in these films, that, that these sounds are to give credibility to fanciful things that don't really exist, and you can reason it out uh, by remembering what you've heard in the real world and maybe have a bit of science to it. I think you do a better job in creating those illusions. So study different things. It's good. Time for one more question. Maybe someone has it. Yeah, the back row is pretty quiet. Back back row. Uh, Dominic John, Star Wars Underworld. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, you would often have a bunch of sounds for George to pick. Do you recall if there were any that you really wished you had chosen but you didn't? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, you get used to, uh, and I, the, the, the first Star Wars film was when I was a newcomer. Uh, and I didn't understand when someone would not pick what I wanted to do. <laughs> and, 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 but you learn over the years that when you're creating sounds, it's a, it's a subjective judgment that's put on things. It's like, like playing someone a piece of music and you say, do you like it or you don't like it? And you, they don't have to give a reason why. And yes, there's always a certain amount of rejection, you know, with sounds. I'll make up, and I'll. I might make a campaign for what I think we is my favorite or what direction we should go in. And sometimes it doesn't get there. And that still happens even today, when I go into any new film. Um, there'll be sounds that I'll be I'll be crushed because the director is, will say something like, oh, well, now I don't want that. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I did But that happens with everybody, you know, who contributes to a movie and you know, whether it be artwork or concept design. Was that? Yeah, that? That was my phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Your phone is talking. Um, <laughs> so that, record that. Yeah, right. So it does happen. And, and you know, on the first movie, when, when there were sounds that uh, George may not want, and he would say, no, nah, I need something different. Uh, he might try to describe what he wanted, and I'd work on that. I'd save everything, because sometimes you come back to it, and it gets used for something else. And uh, actually, that's quite true. That there was not that much left behind, especially after doing six films. Uh, pretty much, you know, I, even when I was making sounds on the later films, the prequels, sometimes I would go back to elements from the early tapes because they just had a signature to them that it's hard to reproduce digitally. And I'd make something out of an old element of some kind, and that was satisfying. Maybe something that was rejected. In fact, I know there were some things that were not used in the first movie that ended up being reworked and showed up later. So many spaceships we had to create. I mean, I mean, it's it. There was three more vehicles and five more kinds of speeders. I'm trying to come up with something for all of them. It's, it's sometimes hard to find a new sound. Well, thank you, Ben. Okay, thank you you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys so day. much for coming and have a great day.